Hello everyone, so sorry about all the difficulties there. Some of you I think were hearing three Gareth's at one time. So that's not great. So let me just take over from where Gareth left off. Um, so my name's Emma, I work with the team here at Imperial College and I have the pleasure of working and talking every day with wonderful researchers like Wendy and Christina that we'll be talking to today. Um, so before we get started, just a little bit of digital event housekeeping. This is obviously the point in a normal event where I point you all to the fire escapes, but presumably you're aware of where those are in your own home. Um, so the first thing to say is that we will be spending lots of time today answering your questions. If you have one, please post it in the comments uh, below. They'll be moderated by our team to help, just to help us get through as many as we can. And we're really sorry in advance if we can't get to your question in time. We'll try our best. Just when you are commenting and posting your questions, please make sure you're respectful of others when you're asking your question. We will be deleting questions that are offensive and contain explicit material, so just a warning there. And we want to create an open discussion, so please get involved, tell us what you think. There's never a stupid question. Um, so it gives me really great pleasure to introduce our two speakers today. I will let them do that themselves because they are obviously their, an expert in their own experience and their own lives. So, Christina, I'll come to you first. Could you tell us a little bit about your role and what you're working on around COVID-19? My name is Christina Aitchison and I'm a um, Principal Clinical Academic Fellow in the School of Public Health. Um, I'm a medical doctor by background and I've trained in epidemiology and public health. Prior to joining um, Imperial, I worked a lot on outbreak response for Public Health England, as, as well as doing a uh, secondment to WHO during the uh, West, uh, West Africa Ebola outbreak. But at the moment, um, my research interests are essentially um, evaluating uh, public health programmes, predominantly child and adolescent. Um, but at the moment, I am working on the REACT study. So this is a, is a COVID study, which I think we're going to talk about uh, a little bit um, later. Fantastic. Thank you, Christina. That's great. Uh, and the same to you, Wendy. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Wendy Barclay. I'm a virologist. I'm not clinically qualified. Um, I've been trained to work in a laboratory uh, with viruses like influenza and now COVID. So I lead a research team at Imperial College London who do basic research to try and understand viruses like flu and, and SARS viruses. We want to understand how they jump from animals into humans, how they transmit through the air between people, and then what we do about, about how we fight them off. And I'm also involved in the REACT study at Imperial, working with Christina, uh, and uh, have met many new friends in our uh, efforts to try and uh, deal with the current outbreak. Fantastic. Thank you, Wendy. So before we dive into a bit more of the detail and, and get to answering all of your juicy questions, um, Wendy and Christina would really like to ask you all a question that will actually help their research um, and help them think about what we're working on here at Imperial. So in the YouTube event description, right at the bottom, you'll find a link to a really short anonymous poll and it will ask you two questions. The first question is, would you want to take, what do you want to take a test to know your COVID-19 antibody status? So whether you've already had and recovered from COVID-19. And the second question is, if you took the test and tes tested positive, so indicating that you'd already had COVID-19 and recovered, would you be more likely to visit someone vulnerable? So be honest, it's anonymous. Um, and we'll be coming back to those answers in just a few minutes. So to set, to set the scene a bit of this discussion, I've just got a few questions that, that, we, that have come in before now and that we've been asked a lot in the past. Um, about antibody testing. So if I can come to you, Wendy, first, what do we mean by antibody testing? Yeah, so um, for those of you in the audience who are not um, scientifically trained, you will have heard a lot about antibodies and antibody tests. Antibodies are uh, things that we all make in our blood uh, in response to being infected by viruses and bacteria and other pathogens. And our immune system make these antibodies, they're very, very specific. Each antibody that you make is specific for the different virus that might be infecting you at that time. And it's part of your immune response that lingers after you've recovered from the infection uh, and hopefully 
protects you from being reinfected by that same virus ever again, because there's a very specific match between the antibody you've made and the virus or bacteria that was infecting you. So that's great. That, that's a good way of being protected by your own immune system. But um, people like us as scientists can use those antibodies as markers in the blood of people to discover who's been infected in the past by what kinds of viruses or bacteria. So by taking the blood sample and looking for the specific antibodies to any one specific pathogen, we can say who's been infected and who hasn't. Amazing, brilliant summary. Thank you, Wendy. And how has our thinking about testing evolved as, as our understanding of COVID has developed too? Yeah, so whenever a new virus or bacteria comes along, uh, we need to develop tests to be able to detect antibodies in people's blood and the test itself is specific for every new virus that emerges. So in the early days, uh, back in January and February, when this new virus had only just appeared in humans, obviously people were working very, very hard to set those tests up and be ready to start detecting antibodies as people recovered from their infection. But we have to admit that in the early days, the tests were not as wonderful and sensitive and specific as they might be. Obviously, as time has gone by and scientists in the laboratory have improved and refined those tests, we're now discovering uh, that the tests are pretty reliable. And that's part of the work that, that we've been involved with to try and find out which tests are working well and well enough to be used under, under different circumstances. So to begin with, there was a lot of talk about antibody tests not working at all, people not making antibodies for this virus, etc. But now we can find antibodies in nearly every person who's been infected and recovered from COVID. And we, we're beginning to believe that, that they can be used really constructively now. Love that positive, positive message that we can take from that, Wendy. Thank you. Testing the tests, very important. Um, so a question to both of you, and I'll, I'll come to Wendy first with it. How have Imperial been involved in antibody testing? How, how has that itself evolved at Imperial and, and, and where are we at now? Yeah, so, so we entered into this huge project called REACT uh, to try to use the tests to understand how many people in the UK have been infected by the virus. But as I said, the tests, uh, there are many of them out there on the market, some produced by commercial companies, some produced by academic laboratories. And the question was, which test is good enough for, for our task? Uh, so my laboratory have been involved in looking at those tests using a standard set of bloods taken from people. We've got two groups of people, one group of people who we know uh, have been infected and recovered uh, by COVID. Uh, and so we fully expect their blood to contain some antibodies. And in fact, we've got some gold standard tests in our own laboratory, which all of these uh, blood samples work in. And so we use those as our sensitivity panel. We run all the different commercial tests against those to find out how many of those get picked up in the commercial tests. But the other important point here is specificity, because you need to be sure, as you can be at least, that the antibodies that you're picking up in the test in the person's blood really are specific for the new virus and not something that was hanging around from before that's cross-reacting in some way but might not be useful to that person or indicate a recent infection with COVID. So we've got hold of a whole uh, hundreds of blood samples from policemen uh, that were taken way back in early 2019 before this new COVID virus emerged for, from the animal source at all. So it's quite obvious that none of those bloods should contain any of the antibodies uh, that we'd be looking for. And so we, we run all of those hundreds of bloods in the same tests to see which ones don't pick those up because that we want there to be specificity. So we want them to be not picked up uh, uh, in the old bloods and pick up as many as we can in the freshly taken bloods. That makes sense. Thank you, Wendy. And Christina, the same question. So how we how have Imperial been involved in antibody testing? And I suppose particularly from, from your point of view. Yeah, 
Well, I mean, the, the React program is a, is a huge program and there's a lot of work going on um, behind the scenes. And um, certainly the laboratory work that um, Wendy and her team are doing is, is really crucial. As epidemiologists, we're really excited about these point of care sort of lateral flow tests because potentially um, because they could be relatively cheap and inexpensive and a convenient way of um, testing people in the population at scale. It's been really interesting to see what the performance is and whether we, we can use that. And, and, and I know we're getting there in terms of performance at an individual level to give someone an individual result. But for big these big seroprevalence, national seroprevalence studies that, that we do, um, we can adjust for the test sensitivity and specificity. So it doesn't have to perform as well as perhaps you would want to see if you were giving giving it to someone and 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 and, and getting them to sort of act on, on that result. So it's it's uh, yeah we we're um, we're at a really exciting stage with them. And along with the laboratory and the clinical evaluation that Wendy's doing, we've been sort of setting some uh, laying the groundwork about how acceptable, how feasible, how, um, how realistic is it that these lateral flow tests can be done at home and self-administered uh, by people in the general public and then report to us the result that they're seeing um, in the test. So we've done a lot of extensive public engagement work that was followed by a, a small pilot study of usability and then we rolled out to 10,000 people uh, to find out um, whether they understood how the test worked, whether they could perform the test. We tried various iterations of different instruction booklets, different videos, different lancets, different pipettes. We tried lots of different things to, to make these lateral flow tests as easy uh, and as acceptable to use uh, in, the, in the general population as possible. Um, and after having, having done that, um, we're now at the stage where we've rolled out um, to to do the population survey of 100,000 people and it's really exciting. We, we're just um, getting the results, um, starting to get results now. And that's really important to us as epidemiologists because um, we really want to try and understand how wide the widespread the infection is, who has the infection been infecting most? And I suppose more importantly, um, whether antibodies in the blood, uh, you know, remain in the blood for, for some significant periods of time. And also at the mo we, we, there's a lot of interest both in the media by politicians um, about mortality rates. So mortality rates at the moment, when you look at the denominator, so you look at your deaths, it's mainly based on um, sort of current rates of infection. So people presenting themselves for a test because they've got symptoms. But what we know is actually there's been a lot of asymptomatic infection in the population. And these antibody tests, which are a marker, a sort of a longer term marker of past infection, are giving us some real insights about into how what proportion of the population may have been infected but never went to, for a test in the fourth, first place. So that has its would have a fairly significant impact in terms of the accuracy or getting better and more accurate mortality data related to COVID. So it's telling us everything there is to know almost. <laughs> yes, broadly. I suppose it's, it's worth mentioning that the, at this point, and again, this is an evolving process and, um, and Wendy was saying previously about how our learning and thinking and understanding about antibody tests has evolved. At the moment, and this is the message we're really sort of hammering home to participants of our study and which we did a lot of public engagement work to get this message across, is that these tests at an individual level can't give you a reliable result um, and therefore we don't want people to, to, to act on them. And some of the follow up work we were doing is just to see that, whether that message has got across, whether people have understood that this is a, a reliable test and that they shouldn't change their behaviour, but actually at a population level, it can give us some um, really, um, really interesting findings. Yeah, it's really interesting that you say that, Christina, because we've got the results of the poll. The results are in. Thank you for everyone who uh, who gave us their opinion on that. And it's really interesting because almost 100 percent of our audience uh, said that they would want to know their antibody status. And equally, interestingly, almost 100% said that if they took the test and tested positive, they'd be more likely to visit someone vulnerable. Um, so just coming to you, Wendy, what are your initial thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that's pretty much what we predicted might be the answer to the first one. And part of our 
our, our aspiration this evening is to explain why those antibody tests and that change in behaviour are, are not what we would advise. I think there's two reasons from my point of view, um, two, two points to get across. One is that um, although the antibodies indicate that you've been infected by the virus, we still don't know for sure that having antibody protects you from being infected again. And it, it could well be, for example, that uh, one scenario is that the antibody means that if you get infected again, you don't get overtly sick, you might not know you were even infected, but you might be infected with the virus and capable of passing that on to someone else. So that idea that because you're antibody positive, you can go and visit your frail auntie in Glasgow or whatever is not a good idea because you might be silently infectious and putting her at possibly more risk than if you'd have been antibody negative when you might have been more likely perhaps to show disease with your infection. So we just don't know yet because this new virus hasn't been around for long enough. Not very many people in the world have actually been re-exposed uh, once they've acquired antibodies in the first place. The other thing to say about these tests is that they're not what we would call a quantitative test. Nearly all the tests we're using, the lateral flow tests, give a band that, that a person reads off, um, but it doesn't really tell you how much antibody you've got. I mean, we, we don't really know then there's a possibility, for example, that if you've got lots of antibody, you might be completely immune from the virus. But if you've got a low amount of antibody, you aren't. That just isn't enough to protect you. So the test is an indication of something that's happened in the past, but not of how you are right now. And the other thing that is becoming quite apparent from people who are looking at antibodies across the board using a lot of different tests, the, including the lateral flow test, but also including much more, let's say, laboratory precise kinds of tests. We, we're beginning to think that there might be such a thing called immuning, uh, waning immunity. So although you got infected, you recovered, you made an immune response and you had some antibody, over the following three to six months, we're beginning to see levels of antibody in people fading away. So the worry would be that somebody would take an antibody test this month, know that they were antibody positive, and then uh, in three months time, believe that they are still antibody positive and possibly immune. Uh, but in fact, their antibodies might have faded away by that time and they may no longer be protected from infection or, or could still get the silent infection and pass the disease on. So for all of those reasons, we would not recommend that anybody relies on antibody at the moment as a way of saying for sure that they are protected or that they can't pass the virus on to somebody else who's vulnerable. Just the final thing to say really on the tests, particularly the lateral flow tests that we've been looking at in the lab, is although we've been trying very hard to identify the best ones to use in the huge studies that Christine has been talking about where we roll out to 100,000 people, even the best tests in the laboratory still pick up what we call false positives. So there is still a small percentage of people in that cohort I referred to, the policeman whose blood was taken way back early, more than, you know, 2019 before they could possibly have ever been infected by COVID-19, that score positive in the test. And we don't think that those are immune people, they're just people who've got something else in their blood which is cross-reacting with the test and giving the positive line on the readout. So there's a chance that you might score positive in the lateral flow test and you haven't ever been infected by COVID-19 and therefore you can't possibly be immune even if a positive score was truly a, an indication of immunity. So for all of those reasons together, uh, we'd like to convince you to change your answer to, to that second question at, by the end of this evening. Well, it certainly made me think what I would have answered, Wendy, so thank you. Um, Christina, any thoughts on that before we move to, to some more questions? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I would reiterate all of, of what Wendy has said. And, you know, maybe two, maybe a month ago, these, these tests 
weren't even very reliable um, in terms of whether it could tell you whether you had a past infection. But certainly and absolutely at the moment, we do not know prospectively what that means to have an antibody in your blood. And therefore, behaviour going forward should categorically not change. Um, and if any, it, 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 that's it, it, if we see that sort of behaviour change, it could potentially lead to in, increased sort of transmission if lots of people are, are, are getting or accessing antibody tests and then acting on those on, on those results. At the, at, there is some misreporting in the media, immunity passports and um, antibodies providing um, protection against reinfection. But but at the moment, absolutely, there is not enough evidence to be able to to respond in that way to an antibody test. And I would go back to this, this issue of, of false positives. And I think over the next few months, we are going to see much better tests that are much more accurate at the individual level in terms of telling you whether you've had the infection. And that can be useful information itself. Let's say you live with someone who had uh, signs and symptoms of COVID. Maybe they had a, a, an antigen test at the time. Um, for current infection and they were positive and you ha you didn't have any symptoms. So you might be left wondering, well, did I or did I not have the infection? Um, obviously, if it's a, a, a week or two weeks yeah. on um, or, or three weeks and then you take an antibody test and that's positive, that could tell you that actually in your household, you also were infected, but you didn't show signs and symptoms. Um, but this issue of false positivity is, is, is still a problem at the moment, telling someone they have an antibody when they when they actually don't. And we need to get that abso abs absolutely right um, before we um, give any advice to the public in terms of how they respond to, to, to test results based on antibody tests. Absolutely. I think that's really important. And, and there's a lot of uncertainty. And as Wendy, you were saying, you know, our, our knowledge of COVID and, and testing has developed so quickly over the last few months that obviously there's still a lot more to find out. So lots of great questions coming in. Thank you ever so much for those of you who submitted questions in advance and who are posting in the YouTube comments now. So the first question um, from our audience, Christina, I'll um, direct it to you. So the question's from Mary. Thank you, Mary. Um, I've heard antibody testing is useful for data gathering, but the inherent small inaccuracy means it's not very useful for individuals. Is this true? Does it mean that for people the test is unhelpful? Yes. So, um, Mary, that's a, that's a great question. And it's very much something that we've been trying to communicate to participants of our study who are helping us with our uh, to, to, to find out or discover um, what the levels of antibodies are in, in the population. Um, as, as Wendy and myself were saying, these tests at the moment aren't specific or sensitive enough. So they do miss um, uh, some people who may have antibodies, but the test says that they don't, or vice versa, people who don't have antibodies, and then the test tells them that they do. So um, at the moment, they are not sensitive and, and specific enough to do that. I, I'll give you the example of, of screening programmes. So you have in the UK, you have screening programmes for cervical cancer, for breast cancer. Um, and the, the initial screening pro screening tests themselves um, generally aren't as don't perform as well as perhaps a more diagnostic test that you do later on. Um, but at the moment, we, we don't have that with the antibody test. So at the, at the moment, you can't um, really read into it. It's not reliable enough at the individual level to make any um, decisions about about behaviour change. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting and, and great question, Mary. I suppose kind of following on from that, we had a question from uh, Nora ahead of the event. Um, so, so can antibody tests detect very small numbers of antibodies and what's the, the kind of optimum time frame for detection if, if there is one? I wonder if Wendy will be best placed to answer. Yeah, so I mean, going back to what people were saying very early on in the outbreak, there was a, a sort of rumour, if you like, or a suspicion that some people weren't making any antibodies at all, which would have really confounded actually the sort of study that we're trying to conduct in the REACT team. Um, it now turns out that, that nearly everybody makes antibodies after COVID, probably 99% of people have had antibodies detected, but you do have to wait a little bit longer in order to see those antibodies. So in our own study, we decided that we wouldn't look in anybody uh, less than 21 days after they'd had symptoms. Normally, with some other tests, 
uh, infections, you can you can detect antibodies in people's blood even as early as seven days after infection. But that doesn't seem to have been the case with COVID. We're not sure whether that's something specific for the virus itself or whether or not the tests we're using are still not really as sensitive as they could possibly be if we keep refining in them in the laboratory. But for now, at least, we're using the sort of 21 day period as a, as a time in which we would expect people who've been infected to have responded with an antibody. But again, we are finding quite a big difference, uh, not with our lateral flow tests, but with the type of quantitative tests that one can perform in laboratories. There is quite a big difference in the amount of antibody that individuals make. Um, for example, people who have recovered from an infection um, asymptomatically, so, so we, we know sometimes that people have been infected, they haven't shown any symptoms at all, but when they've done a swab, they have, we have detected virus in their nose and throat. Those people often do make a little bit less antibody than people who've ended up in hospital with very severe COVID. Um, so there are levels of antibody. And again, going back, we just don't know how much you need to be immune but we can detect all of those levels and add them all up in our seroprevalence studies to, to understand if somebody's been asymptomatically infected and and or symptomatically infected so we can count all of them but the levels themselves are quite variable so we know we can see what we're dealing with but we need a little bit more to help us interpret what that means is i think what what i'm getting from that wendy yes yes a question now from uh, Jeff on YouTube. Thank you, Jeff, for your question. So if antib antibodies don't provide long term protection, what does this mean for a vaccine and the usefulness of a vaccine? I'll come to you, Wendy, on that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so. We, we think that after natural infection with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, we see this loss of antibody over time and we think that that means that those people are not really protected from infection. That's based on a number of different things. One, one of the experiments is a very old experiment uh, which was conducted at the Common Cold Unit decades ago now where volunteers were purposefully infected with a, another type of coronavirus and then re-challenged and this antibody waning was noted and the people on re-challenge one year after their first infection got reinfected. So what we hope is that the majority of vaccines that are being developed around the world, and there are, I think I read yesterday, 137 different ones in going into phase one trials at the moment. Um, we hope that the vaccines are going to be even better than natural immunity is. Um, it's a tall order for a vaccine to do that. Most, most vaccines would be very happy to achieve the same level of immunity as one gets from recovering from, from the infection itself. But actually, we think that the SARS-CoV-2 virus has got some very clever strategies for interfering with a person's own ability to make a long-lasting immune response, a long-lasting antibody response, whereas most of the vaccines that are being used are, are not really the SARS virus itself. It's, it's that you've taken the, the antigens of the virus and presented them to a person in a completely different way than the virus would normally do that. And so the immune response to the vaccine ought to be quite different in character than the immune response to the virus itself. So hopefully some of these vaccines will produce long lasting immunity uh, and will be in a better place. <laughs> Absolutely. And with 137, I hope that one of those at least is, uh, is, is good to go, as it were. Um, so Christina, coming to you now, another uh, great question from Rohan on YouTube. So has anyone with antibodies tested positive for COVID again? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think certainly there have been some reports um, from China where there, have been, there has been reinfection. Um, I suppose the question, the big question now is that perhaps as, as countries come into a second wave and people have followed up and certainly in this country, healthcare workers are uh, and social care workers are a sort of fairly captive audience. And, you know, if there were to be a second wave, 
uh, many many have have had the virus and recovered. Some unfortunately haven't. Um, and but in, in a second wave, um, it would be easy to track and see because they're very sort of generally higher risk of exposure to see if they get, get reinfected again. So the suggestion is yes, there is evidence of reinfection, perhaps not as widespread as 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 um, you would expect, which suggests maybe that the second time you get it, the infection is milder. But um, it's still um, fairly early days, I think. And I think as we see uh, sort of pockets of second outbreaks in other countries, we'll have much more information on that. Of course, yeah, absolutely. It'll be really useful. Um, and Wendy, can back to you. We've got a, had a question from Cecile. Um, why is it scientifically challenging to develop a highly specific antibody test for COVID? What are you really dealing with here that, that makes it tricky? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think in the first place, you're just starting from scratch because it's a brand new virus and uh, one can take a guess at the right components to put in the test. So what you do is you artificially generate the antigens of the virus and there are actually two. There's, there's the spike protein, which is the thing that sticks out of the virus's surface and the thing that most people's immune system would see first. But there's also a protein that sits inside the virus particle called the N protein. Um, and it turns out that we make a lot of antibody to the N protein when we get infected by these kinds of viruses. But that the N proteins of this new virus for SARS-CoV-2 is a bit similar to the N protein of a series of other viruses that are also coronaviruses, uh, but that have existed and passed between people for, for very many hundreds of years. And nearly all of us have been infected by the seasonal coronaviruses that cause about 20% of common colds that we experience every year. So the problem is that there's a, a difficulty there in the specificity of, of your assay. And what people have had to do is to get the balance just right of how sensitive to make the assay uh, so that you pick up as many of the people who've been infected as possible without picking up the background antibodies that are left behind if somebody was infected by a seasonal coronavirus and not by COVID-19 itself. Um, and there are various ways of doing that. One clever way is called quenching, where you actually make all the end proteins of the seasonal viruses and sort of stir them in the mix to mop up all the antibodies you don't want to see and allow you to focus in on the specific ones you do. So most of the tests these days have got that kind of level of specificity. Um, but all of that takes some considerable time because it's a matter of changing things uh, here and there a little bit at a time and then working out what that's done to your sensitivity versus your specificity. So, <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. That's a great answer to a great question. Um, so coming back to you, Christina, now a question from Rifat about dif different countries and are the antibody tests standardised across different countries or are we seeing quite a lot of different tests out there? Yeah, so th there are there are hundreds of, of different tests out there. Um, it's really quite hard to keep track um, of, of how many and certainly, and I suppose uh, Wendy knows more than me, that, that because the, the REACT study is, is becoming a sort of more well known, we are getting a lot of manufacturers, some um, in quite some quite small, some quite big companies coming forward and, and wanting us to um, test, test their antibody tests. Um, they all sort of have a, a, quite a similar format. They sort of sometimes vary in whether they have two bands or one. So some 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 lateral flow tests uh, test collectively for an, the antibody IgG and the antibody IgM. And the, the, the distinction between the two is IgG is the antibody that is 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 um, found in the blood sort of slightly sort of slightly later after infection, but it lasts longer in the blood. And that's the one that often is correlated um, with immunity in, in, in other infectious diseases. And then you get IgM, which is produced very much in the acute phase of the of, of, of the, your body's response to a, uh, an infection, but then drops off very quickly. And in fact, for some diseases, so for example, like measles, we actually look for IgM as a marker of current infection because it is often present 
um, still when the, when the person has sort of clinical disease or sort of very shortly after. So 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 some tests basically um, test for both all at once and have and have have one line, a bit like a pregnancy test. You know, um, you put your blood sample in and then a blue line go, goes red. Um, so, uh, some tests have just um, the one band, but it's just for IgG, so they just look at, at the IgG level um, or whether it's present or not. And then you have some tests, um, like the tests that we're using in the REACT2 study, which has two bands, one for IgG and one for IgM. Um, but in our seroprevalence study, we're only looking at the IgG uh, band and whether that's present, because um, at the moment, um, a lot of the antibody tests are, are not performing very well or as reliably for IgM. And also it's the IgG that's a marker of the sort of uh, long term um, sort of antibody levels. So which is which is why I've been doing that. But otherwise, the cassettes sort of generally look quite the same. Sometimes there's one well um, to, to put the, the blood in and also the buffer. So a buffer is just a sort of fairly neutral saline liquid that just helps the blood track through the device so that then um, the blood or the if you do have antibodies are picked up at the various sites on the on the cassette and some have two. But but gen generally there are sort of all variations on theme, all of varying quality and performance. And that's why it's really important that all the tests are, are properly validated in a reputable lab like Wendy's um, and then go through all the regulatory processes and checks um, with our, our regulatory bodies to get approval in our country because we do do realize there's a lot around and the quality is quite variable. Absolutely. Thanks, Christina. Really important. Um, so over to you, Wendy, for, for a, quite a specific question, I suppose, from Roshan on uh, on YouTube. And you may just have to give us a little bit of background so that we all uh, understand the question, too. So lots of people have had T cell responses, but no antibodies. So can we solely rely on antibody tests to see if we've had an immune response. Yeah, there are some papers coming out suggesting that. So let me just explain a little bit of background. Your, your immune system has two arms to it. Uh, one is called the humoral immune system, and that's the antibody part we've been talking about. And there are a set of cells that, that drive that called B cells. The B cells make the antibodies and the antibodies float around in your blood um, for, for various lengths of time, as we've discussed. But the B cells can't do that without help from the T cells. Uh, the T cells are what we call the cellular immune response. And the, the T cells can do two things, actually. They can help the antibodies get made, and they can also work in their own right to attack uh, the pathogens and also cells infected by the pathogens and sort of destroy them and help you clear the virus from your body. The problem with T cell immunity from a diagnostic point of view is it's really hard to measure the, the sort of laboratory assay that one needs to do to know if somebody's got T cell immunity is complicated and has to be done in a laboratory. So T cell tests are just not available out there to send out in the way that we've been doing in the REACT study and, and somebody could not test in their own home the presence of T cell immunity. Um, I think the, in the end, the proportion of people who have T cell immunity and no antibodies at all will probably turn out to be fairly low. Early days to know for sure yet. But I think we, the, the point is well made that we might slightly underestimate the number of people who've been infected so far by using antibody tests. There could be an immune response that if you could measure it in the hundreds of thousands numbers would pick up some people who have been infected at a low level have made a T cell response, but haven't really made enough antibody that gets that is picked up in our current tests. But overall, the, the tests we're working with at the moment are the only ones that are really amenable to these large scale studies to count who's been infected so far. Um, and until there's a sort of very reliable and usable T cell test for use in the home, I think we just have to go with the best we've got. That makes absolute sense, Wendy, thank you. Um, so just before we wrap up, one quick question to each of you. Um, I'll start with you, Christina. So 
what is it what's the next stage for you what are, what are you hoping to to progress working on and and what's the what does the future hold well the next stage would be a holiday i think wendy and i have been working 24 7 for since this started really since we were given the opportunity to work on the react program which has been a great privilege um and um i've certainly um learned a, learned a lot um and i'm also um involved in the operational side of things so um everyone knows that the nhs has a test and trace system and and i work in the public health uh, arm of arm of that response providing advice to schools uh care homes um, members of the public so um that's been interesting and and that's that that work is evolving as well but in terms of react just just when you think that that everything is settled and uh, the studies are going along more interesting questions pop up um and um that we're very keen keen to answer exhausted but keen to answer so that so that there's there's opportunities perhaps um well with the with, certainly with the prevalent zero prevalence study we're going to be repeating that at regular intervals and that's going to be really important um because um, it may give us an indication of waning um, antibody levels in the population. So let's say we see infection rates rise in September when all the schools come together. But if antibody levels sort of remain the same or start to drop in areas where they've been higher previously, that might indicate that, that the antibody levels um, are, are dropping. We're also really interested to find out um, look at sort of spatial and also a variation by sort of social demographic factors. There's some been some real interest um, and concern that certain groups in society, uh, be they more deprived, be they from um, uh, minority backgrounds, um, and and we're we're wanting to sort of try and answer some of those questions and 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 and, and sort of uh, uh, look at that in more detail. So that that will be going on. And then I think there's some discussion about whether we should consider extending into care homes to see how um, how much infection or past infection um, um, there has been in, in care homes, potentially extending the study to children. At the moment, um, we've we've just been doing adults. I mean, the, the test itself involves a self-administered finger prick. We've been asking um, participants how acceptable they they think it would be to do the test on children. But there's lots of ethical issues, uh, especially around consent and safeguarding that need to be addressed before we do that. And it may be more appropriate to extend um, antibody testing in schools in a more sort of uh, observed and controlled environment than letting people sort of loose with lancets at, at home on their on their children. So these are sort of ethical questions that, that we need to discuss. So I, I, I suppose that's I, for me, that's kind of sort of my our future. How do we extend? Um, the antibody and then potentially if, if, if Wendy finds a, a wonder test replacing the, the lateral flow test that we're currently using um, um, and, 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 pu and putting that there as, as well. So just a little bit to get on with in the future then Christina. <laughs> just a little bit but, but first the holiday I think. <laughs> Sounds great. Wendy just to come to you what, what's, what's next for you? Yes, yeah, so again, looking forward to a bit of a holiday, perhaps in a few weeks time. Um, but I think as to follow on from what Christina was saying as part of React, uh, new new types of collection. So we're looking at dry blood spots. We're looking at capillary blood um, as opposed to people doing the test in their own home. There's quite a lot of interest in that, but also perhaps saliva or other fluids that that do contain antibodies and might be easier for children to use. So there's some more laboratory sort of validation and testing to keep up with things as we go. Uh, I, as a scientist who've been interested in the way viruses evolve, uh, am very, very interested to understand what's going to happen next with SARS-CoV-2. If we do start seeing people being reinfected by the virus, will it change? Uh, the, the virus itself and what impact will that have? So from an academic and, and an important sort of understanding point of view, um, there are two arms to the REACT study. One is looking at the virus in people's noses and one is looking at the antibodies. And by, by sort of combining the two arms, we may pick up people who are being reinfected and then be able to hone in and really study why those people have been reinfected and what the virus is doing now. 
uh, which could be incredibly important, for example, for do we need to update the vaccines as we go or is this virus going to stay stationary? What can we expect in the coming years? Because I think this virus is not going to go away. It's going to stay with us. It's going to come back as a seasonal respiratory pathogen year on year. And uh, we need we need to be on top of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Wendy. So that's all we've got time for, sadly, at the moment. So I, we're really keen to hear what you think about this event. We're running a few of these. Um, we've just posted a link in the YouTube comments for a short survey. We'd really love for you to complete it. It will really help us make this kind of thing so much better. Our next COVID Q&A is taking place on the 5th of August at 12.30, and that's all about vaccine development with the wonderful team from the Shattuck Lab here at Imperial. Really excited for that one. Um, but for now, all that's left to say is thank you ever so much, Christina and Wendy. Thank you ever so much that's helped make this event happen in the background. There's lots of us um, and hope to see you all again soon. Bye.